Okay, so maybe we can start. Um, just to check up, can you hear me, panelists and speaker? Okay. So, um, welcome to this first webinar of Nebias Academy. So, we're very happy to see that many of you have joined already, more than 600 people. We're expecting almost a thousand. Hopefully, everyone will be able to connect. I will make a very short introduction to this webinar. So, my name is Julien, I chair Nebias. And uh, you've probably been in contact with me by email for the, for the registrations. Um, so we make a sort of summary here of what is possible with the Zoom webinar. So basically all participants will be muted uh, without video. We do not recommend to use the chat. Uh, instead, we would like people to use the question and answer um, panel. So this uh, black banner here shows you what you should be able to see from your uh, screen. And you can raise hand and maybe the panelists who are right now visible uh, in the uh, video icons um, would somehow eventually try to address your points. But question and answers are much better. So please do use them. We don't recommend to leave the meeting, but if you do, you should be able to reconnect uh, unless it's completely full. Okay, so a couple of notes. Um, hopefully the panelists will try to answer all the questions live. If not, then we will store the questions and we will answer them after the webinar and store them on the image.sc forum in a thread dedicated to this webinar. And finally, this webinar will be recorded and, you, and uploaded to YouTube Nebias channel. Uh, so we'll send you the link and hopefully within a couple of days it will be available. So let me try to introduce very briefly what, uh, for those who don't know what Nebias is and what Nebias Academy is. So Nebias started like uh, several years ago, almost eight years ago, originally with um, the gathering of some people organizing um, by image analysis courses at the MBL, so mainly Kota Miura, uh, from 2012 to 2017. And from there, um, a small group of people actually gathered and created UBias, which was originally uh, an event, a symposium that happened in Barcelona and Paris. And from there, we have moved on to uh, create new bias uh, with, um, so to say, the luck of being funded by the EU under the cost program. So, new bias organized in the last four years four conferences, um, short term scientific missions, gathered over 42 countries, members thereof and then have developed uh, several resources online uh, about image analysis tools. Um, so you find two links to repositories uh, and uh, Bioflow's uh, benchmarking application. So most importantly uh, for today, uh, Nubias also organized 15 training schools that um, gathered um, in these 15 events about 415 trainees out of a thousand applicants. And we quickly realized that the demand for teaching and training in biomedical analysis is huge and that we could not actually satisfy um, say the demand from everyone. So from there, uh, looking at the future, we decided to create New Bias Academy, which aims to provide sustainable material and activities focused on training in biomedical analysis in many ways. And the first way is uh, this series of webinar uh, and online lectures, which somehow has been um, set up to be rather intensive because of the COVID-19 confinement that we're all experiencing at the moment. So we hope you will enjoy uh, this webinar and the next ones. And I will introduce the uh, speaker and panelists. So Ignacio Arganda Carreras is uh, ICA Basque Research Fellow at the University of, the ba of Basque Country in San Sebastian in Spain. Um, so he will be your uh, main speaker today. And he will be helped by Estibaliz and Carlos from the University uh, Carlos III in Madrid and by Daniel Saez from the EPFL in Lausanne. So this is it for me. And now I will ask uh, Ignacio to share his screen on top of mine. Uh, okay, let's see if I can. Okay, now I can. Okay. Hello, everybody, and thanks so much uh, for the introduction, Julian. And I would like to, first of all, thank everybody for here. It's such a pleasure in such difficult times to see all the interest in, in the work that we do. And also, I would like to thank the organizers and their families as well, because, of course, to be able to work on, at, from home, we need the, the support from the people surrounding us. So even to, to be here for an hour and a half, we probably need someone else supporting our actions. So. 
thanks a lot. And that being said, and as I'm, I've already been uh, introduced, let me just tell you a little bit about my background. I'm a computer scientist, uh, usually working on computer vision, uh, machine learning, image processing applied to bioimage analysis. And for many years now, I'm, I've been also working a lot on developing Fiji and IMJ plugins. Today, my idea is to uh, make an introduction to the field of machine learning applied to bioimage analysis. And this very nice plugin that just came up a few months ago that is called Deep Image J. So please uh, do not worry if you are not uh, so much related to the field of machine learning because we're gonna go through the basis, we're gonna uh, show the important and relevant concepts and definitions so we are all in the same pace. Then we're gonna go from the beginning towards uh, today, the deep learning era that we live on. So uh, for that, we need to make an overview of uh, artificial in, uh, neural networks that we will do until the, hopefully, the second part of the presentation that will be uh, more, or less, more or less practical. Usually we do this, as Julian said, in the NVS courses with people in front of you, we can play with the, with the computers. In this case, I will do it, but I assume that you all get on your emails uh, the links to the notebook, the data, and the presentation that I'm, I'm, I'm doing right now. So you could also follow it later or even at the same time that I, that I do it. As uh, Julian already said, we have three very nice uh, moderators with us today. So please make all the questions you want in the questions and answer uh, panel. Even if you don't get an answer right away, as uh, Julian said, in principle, we're gonna get uh, all the answers collected and all the questions collected, and then we will publish them uh, maybe either in the forum or in any other uh, uh, media, okay? So feel free to make all the questions. Okay, so then let's just start. First things first, what is machine learning? Because uh, many people, even the, the ones who work on it every day, we have a rough time to, to define it sometimes. So when I have to teach my computer vision uh, students, what I usually put them is this very first slide, what I told them, thanks to technology in the last uh, decade, if not centuries, we have uh, made possible to automatize many tasks that require for humans, a significant uh, amount of time and especially repetitive manual work, right? But now, thanks to technology and the use of big data, we can automatize tasks that are not only uh, mechanical, but also that require what we could call a certain degree of intelligence, okay? So what kind of uh, tasks are, uh, am I talking about here? Well, let's say that there are some tasks that are um, easy for humans, but difficult uh, for machines. For example, face recognition, no? uh, we wake up every day and then we immediately recognize the people in, uh, in our surrounding, no? our family, our friends, our acquaintances, our uh, neighbors, especially now that we live all confined and with very few people. But if you think about it, it's a very difficult problem because uh, the, the face changes a lot based on the position, the physical position, the illumination, if I turn the light on or off, if I change my haircut, or if I, I use a different dye, I have a hat, glasses, etc. So because of that, for uh, many years, it's been a very difficult problem uh, for machines. Some other tasks are actually hard for humans, especially those that involve uh, working with tons of data, no? large amounts of data, even space Sorry, recognition. Sorry, it's yeah. Matthew. Uh, do you have something scratching in your microphone? Oh, no, maybe I moved too much. Yeah, because we can uh, hear all your movements and it's like a scratch. Like okay, a... okay, maybe add it. Oh, okay, yeah, right. Should, should it be better now, right? Great, thank you. <laughs> Sorry about that. <laughs> Things of the uh, live webinars. Okay, so. Um, I was saying that even um, some tasks that are hard for humans uh, due for the, um, the large amount of data that they involve. No? For example, even uh, face recognition is not the same thing to recognize the, the people that we have around than to recognize the millions of faces that are, for example, in the Google uh, databases or the Facebook uh, databases. 
So what we call uh, data mining, machine learning, pattern recognition are all these uh, techniques that have achieved very good results lately in this direction, you know, making what we call intelligent systems a very important part of uh, research, but also business model. If we know about uh, machine learning, now if we have this on our resumes, it's a, it's a big plus. But of course, uh, don't get me wrong, this is nothing new. Um, that was already defined in 1959 by somewhere, uh, Arthur Samuel, sorry, that said that uh, machine learning is the subfield of computer science that gives uh, computers the ability to learn without being explicitly programmed to do so. Okay, such a grand definition, but what does it mean in practice? Well, in practice, we have some data, say, some data points, samples, objects, uh, you call it. And for example, you may think that we, we, we have made a biological experiment and we have uh, two types of cells. We have wild type cells and we have mutant cells. So what we want um, machine learning to tell us is out of each of those cells, which one belong to one type or the other, to one class or the other. So the purpose of machine learning is actually very simple, is to assign labels to the objects to the point indicating their class. How do we represent our uh, points in, in such a space? Well, we usually represent, for example, ourselves based on some measurements that we take from them. No? We may have taken um, maybe uh, the images in the microscope and then we have measured the area and maybe the average intensity of each of those um, cells. Then we can represent them based on these two um, coordinates that we have here. This set of measurements is what we call features, okay? So there are usually two types of uh, frameworks when we talk about machine learning. We have supervised uh, framework where we start with a set of um, points, the set of cells, samples, that are from which we already know the labels. So we know which ones are uh, mutant, which ones are um, wild type or we have the unsupervised learning framework where we only have the, the, the cells uh, represented by the measurements, by the features, but we don't have the, the labels, okay? That's why we call it unsupervised. But the target is the same. Given a new point in that so-called feature space, because we represent them in, in this uh, feature space, what is the, the label that we have to assign to that new point, okay? So summarizing, we have supervised learning where the data are labeled and the target is to build what we call a model or a classifier to automatically label new data. And we do so by uh, a process that we call training. We train on the data from which we know the labels and we try to uh, label the new data. If the labels are not discrete, we have a regression problem, okay? For example, if I'm doing digit recognition, no? I have images of different digits. The digits can only be uh, from zero to, to nine, okay? So they, they, we have 10 different uh, classes, no? They are discrete, then we have a classification problem. If I have a special uh, image from which I want to estimate the age, the age can be basically any, any real number, no? 27.3, well, then it's a regression problem. Uh, in the unsupervised learning framework, the data don't have labels and the target is to model that data. So we discover the groups inside that, uh, that data, what we call clusters. So that's why we call it clustering, okay? So a few definitions uh, that we may find in any uh, in literature based on machine learning. Um, we say that every sample, no, every point, every, every cell is represented by a feature vector. Now we have this set of measurements, we put them in a vector. So this is what we call uh, the feature vector. The features, the features can actually be qualitative or quantitative. Usually we work with numerical um, features, but they, do, they could also be qualitative, like small, big, short, tall, uh, et cetera. If we are in the supervised learning framework, then usually the classes are predefined. Now we know which classes are available and they're usually many less than the number of, of samples. And usually every sample belongs to only one class. Usually there are uh, different configurations, but in general, this is what we do. And each class in principle, ideally, it has plenty of uh, samples that are similar to each other and different 
to the samples belonging to the other classes. Okay? A very typical um, problem is uh, what we call a binary classification problem. No? Imagine that we have Im images of um, biopsies, and then for every image, we have to say if it belongs to the class tumorous or non tumorous. No? So, two possibilities, two different classes, binary classification problem. And then we define what, what it is the data set. The data set is simply the pair of, for example, the feature vector and the class if we are in the supervised framework, or just the feature vectors if we have uh, if we are in the unsupervised uh, framework. Okay, so when we say that uh, we are creating a classifier or building a classifier, what we're trying to find is a function that relates the feature vectors, you know, each feature vector, with the specific uh, class. You could find in, in the literature some uh, classifiers that take a, what we call a soft decision, okay? Maybe they have a first step where they provide maybe um, the probability of belonging to each class or directly the final class. Now we say this is a hard decision. It applies maybe a threshold to them, uh, to the probabilities and it tells you that directly, oh, this is wild type or this is mutant. It doesn't tell you. Uh, okay, this is 70% uh, sure uh, wild type, 30% mutant. It depends on, on the classifiers. Okay, so when we say that we're training the algorithm, what we're actually doing is adjusting those parameters uh, theta that the, the function may have to minimize an error function. The error or sometimes called cost function or loss function usually in, in neural networks is basically the, the error between the expected output, if we are doing age estimation, well, the expected age, and the predicted age by our model, okay? Very good. So now you may, you may have the question, okay, well now, how do I select the classifiers? How do I evaluate uh, the performance of the classifier and compare them uh, among them? So I say, this one works better than this other one. Well, um, very typical thing, let's say if we have Again, we have, let's say, a binary classification problem. Well, we may uh, consider we have our positive class and our negative class, okay? So at the end of the predictions, we can compare the predictions with the real classes. What we say is the, the ground truth, the real classes of the, of the samples, and the predicted labels. And we say, okay, out of all the, um, the samples, select the predicted as positive, how many were actually positive, no? So that's what we call true positives. If they were wrongly classified as positives, they are false positive. Very, um, very simple, right? And then we have the same for negative class. We have false negatives and true negatives. So we count all of them. Then of course they have to sum up to the total number of samples. And then we have uh, all the positive samples could be in the, with the the original labels, the, top, the true positives plus the false and negatives, and the original negative samples, the true negatives plus the false positives, okay? So out of these um, numbers, we can get different performance metrics, okay? I put them here, uh, all of them, because you can find them in the literature, but the most um, common ones, or let's say the, the typical ones are the true positive rate, or what we call uh, the recall, Okay, which is the proportion of positive samples uh, correctly classified, no? Out of the, my, the total number of real positives, how many my system uh, said that they are the true positives. Okay? And uh, we, have a, we have also the, pre the precision or the positive predicted value. Not to get confused, this is the proportion of the samples classified as positive, okay? Everything that the, the system said that was positive, that were actually uh, positive. Those two metrics, they have uh, values between zero and one, being uh, zero, uh, disastrous uh, classification, disastrous uh, prediction, and one, the best uh, classification um, possible. Of course, uh, usually we, we have to have a trade-off between uh, the two of them. So to summarize them, you may find in the literature, instead of uh, just the two of them, you have the F-score, which is the harmonic mean between both of them. Again, it's between zero and one, and being one, the, the best performance uh, possible when well, you get everything right. Okay, so the next Ignacio, question. Yep. Yes. So there's a question about whether it is possible to uh, evaluate the classification of an unsupervised machine learning method. 
Yeah, of course. Uh, there are other type of metrics for uh, supervised uh, learning mm -hmm. that ha have to be, if you don't know the, um, the labels, in order to do this, you have to measure, for example, how compact the clusters are, or this, this type of things. Okay? So, uh, in general, uh, either you do that, or you, you get some, some labels, you try to do it and supervise and see how well they actually uh, compare with the actual labels in the end, with very similar metrics to those. Uh, Next okay. question. Yes, sorry, there's another question. Uh, so, what, sorry. so the strategy you talk about with the true positives and negatives and so mm -hmm. on, they said that it's dependent of uh, the prevalence of classes. So how is it possible to generalize these measures? So you do it per class. Usually you have a multi-class problem. You, you only have a binary, you don't have a binary classification problem. Then usually you have to calculate those values per class and then you get uh, usually the, um, the error metrics uh, per class. Of course, you can always provide the, the last metric, you know, the, the error rate out of your total number of samples, how many were actually correctly classified as the, the real class they had. Okay, okay. so I keep going. Uh, thanks for the questions, by the way. Um, so the next question that we may have uh, is, okay, now I know how to compare my classifiers, how to compare my models, but what do I do uh, how many samples I choose in order to build my, my classifier. You could be tempted to use all of them, okay? But then usually it's a very bad decision or it's too risky because uh, you take all the samples you have and then you find a very nice um, uh, function to fit all of them. Maybe you are uh, optimizing too much for the training set for your samples and then a new sample that is in principle, in the same distribution of samples, it will be considered as, a, as an outsider, which is, is not, okay? So to prevent this type of uh, situations, what we usually do is the, the typical thing of dividing our data set into two sets, a training set and a test set. The training set is usually about two thirds or 80% of the, the data that we have. And the test set is the, the remaining part, okay? Uh, in the sense that at the end, we're gonna train our algorithm, we're gonna optimize the parameters only for the training set, but we're gonna evaluate it in the test set, okay? So uh, when we uh, apply the classifier to the test, uh, the classifier is seeing samples for the first time, okay? This is a way of knowing how well it is generalizing out of the, the training set. Another option, depending uh, on the number of uh, samples that we have, is the cross-validation, okay? Usually called K-fold cross-validation. We divide our data set in K different groups, K usually five. You know, I hear the example that I put you, is a five-fold cross-validation, where I use uh, uh, one of the groups, one of the folds uh, for testing and the other four for training, okay? So I, I build my model, I calculate my metrics, and then I store that, uh, that metric. Then I repeat the process, from zero, I create a, a new version of the model where the test set is now uh, another one and the others are training. So I repeat this and every time the, the test fold changes. And what I do is I provide as metric the average of the five of them, okay? This is to ensure that at some point, all of the um, samples that I have are gonna be used for training or and for testing, no? Just in case, if I do the training and, and test uh, partitioning, maybe I'm putting all my easy samples in the test or all my difficult um, samples in the test, and this is not very representative of the real problem. Okay, so uh, in a classic way of doing things and by image analysis using um, machine learning, I say classic because uh, let's say before uh, deep learning, we used to, to have this kind of design cycle for our classifier. We would have our scientific question from the real world that to the answer, we have to take our biological samples, put them in the microscope and create a data collection, no? an image collection. Usually we pre-process them to have them uh, with all the images more or less in the same intensities, sizes, etc. 
and then we perform what we do, we call feature extraction. Now we take all those measurements out of the images to represent the images or the pixel, depending on the level at which we are working, um, with a feature vector, the same thing that uh, we just mentioned before. No? Then once we have the vectors, we, we can jump into the supervised learning framework or the unsupervised learning framework. In this case, I'm putting you here, the supervised learning framework, and usually you have these four classic steps where you do first feature selection because sometimes... Uh, Ignatius, okay, yeah. there, there is a question and also there is a, the, the scratch on your switch shot restart, so <laughs> be careful. So the question is the following, how we decide the proportion between the test and the, and the training set? So it depends on the number of samples that you have. Uh, usually um, there are actually now libraries that uh, create the proportions for you and they try to maintain the distribution of the classes in the training and the test set. That way if you, you manage to have a good classifier for the training set, then in principle it should work well for the test set. And mm -hmm. the training set is also representative of the um, of the test set, of everything that is supposed to be out there, okay? Mm -hmm. Thank you. So uh, what I was saying is that, okay, when we do the feature selection or what we used to do the feature uh, selection, we usually get rid of features that were uh, redundant or were repetitive, or maybe they were um, yeah, in, in contradiction with other features. So they were not informative enough, okay? Then we will have to do the model selection, select which type of classifier are we going to use. And then based on this partition that we were just mentioning, we would do um, the training on the, on the training set and the evaluation in the test. Set. If we get, we get a satisfactory result, okay, then it's fantastic. We can say uh, we're done. We can apply that classifier to any new image that we take under the same condition. This is very important. No? We have to, if we want to reuse that uh, train classifier, then we have to take images and do exactly the same pre-processing and feature extraction, okay? And then the performance in principle should be maintained. If we don't get a satisfactory result, which is typical, then we have to go back and revisit any of, this, uh, any of these steps to see if we need to do a different feature selection, use another type of classifier of different uh, parameters, or simply uh, revisit how we did the partitioning between training and test. Okay, what about the type of classifiers that we can choose? Well, all the way uh, until a few years ago, uh, of course, I told you, uh, this is something that has been going on since the 50s. So we have plenty of different uh, classifiers, linear, nonlinear classifiers uh, in the literature. The most popular right before deployment were uh, the support vector machines, uh, or called SVMs, or the random forest, okay? Uh, as we will see later, artificial neural networks were popular a little bit before, but then uh, they, they went a little bit in the, uh, into the darkness for a, for a few years. And in general, what they do is they try to find uh, separations between our data points. Here we have a very nice representation that I took from uh, scikit-learn, which, which, which is a machine learning library in Python then where well, you can see different types of classifiers and the borders that they find in between this training data and this two dimensional space. So you see that some of the solutions are linear, they find some straight lines in, uh, in between the points, some others are less linear, they have different ways of separating the data trying to generalize uh, better in the test. Okay. So because we're gonna talk about um, artificial uh, neural networks, because we need to talk about them in order to, to get to uh, deep learning, we have to go a little bit, a little bit back and in time, okay? So hey, actually, yes? So, sorry, just one question. Um, so does the human select which features are relevant or does the machine learning algorithm classifier select these? They're actually, also methods to do perform uh, feature selection. Okay? There are typical ones like uh, principal component, component analysis. You can take only the, the most informative components. And there are it's also it's just itself another field of a study where you can apply these methods to get the, the most relevant uh, features out of uh, a big set of features. Okay? 
Okay, so back in time, as I said, we need to go back to 1956. It is the, the very first step towards artificial neural networks, okay? This is the, the perceptron, which is a linear classifier, as I mentioned now, it's a very simple classifier. It's a function that takes the vector, okay? The X could be the, the feature vector that we just mentioned. And then it applies a simple formula. It applies a matrix W, which is a matrix of weights, plus a scalar, which is usually called uh, a bias. If this operation is positive, then it assigns the, the vector, the sample, to the positive class. If it is uh, uh, smaller or equal to than zero, then it, it assigns it to the other class, zero or, or minus one. So like, what we're trying to do is find this uh, line over here. Okay? So why was this uh, so important? Well, there was a big excitement about it and, uh, back in the 50s because it was, there was actually an algorithm that was able to find the weights of that function by sample, okay? So it relatively provide more and more samples to the, to the algorithm, and then it finds the, the most appropriate weights to separate linearly the, 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 the set of points, okay? So at the time, it was the first time that uh, it was proven that a machine could learn, no? like just by providing more and more examples, it would have some memory and it would uh, adjust better the, the weights. How, how does it do that? It's very simple. If we apply the formula, if the, the weights um, that, that we use correctly classify the, um, uh, the sample that we are working on, then we don't touch them because they work. We take another sample. If they made a mistake, then we correct the weights proportionally to the error uh, committed. Okay? So we, we, we keep doing this and actually the algorithm stops once, it's, once it finds a linear separation between our data points. It actually only uh, stops uh, if it only converges if there is a linear separation between the data, okay? Basically, we're finding the, the, the best line to separate my, my two clusters. Okay, I'll be then, as I said at the very beginning, so we call uh, the perceptron as a linear machine, so it can learn things that we say like uh, the an and or predicate and we call it in computer science, no? Where we, that we can separate with a single line. But when we have seen things like the X or predicate, we have uh, samples that we need to separate with two lines, well, then that doesn't work. There was also another problem that the, the was mathematically shown that the linearly separable problems were really uh, unlikely when the number of samples were much larger than the actual number of uh, features per, per sample. Okay, well, no problem. They, they, they figured out and said, okay, we use two perceptrons, okay, mathematically. Well, we just put one start with the other. That's what we say, it's a perceptron with one hidden layer. Then we can create these two lines, so no problem. And actually, it was proven that if we stack one more other perceptron, okay, so a perceptron with two hidden layers, it can essentially solve any uh, classification or regression problem, okay, any. So it's fantastic, right? It was just a little tiny problem. That was that there was no algorithm to build, to learn from, from samples as there was with the, with the single perceptron, okay? So at the moment in the 60s, back in at the end of the 60s, this led to what is known as the first winter of neural networks. And well, the concentration of the F14 artificial intelligence towards uh, symbolic systems, okay. When did they uh, come back to business? Well, we can summarize uh, the early work in perceptron by saying that the architecture was right. Okay? Well, essentially they could solve anything, but the training approaches were wrong or we, we didn't know how to train them. But things changed in 1986 with the book of this grand title, Parallel Distributed Processing Explorations in the Microstructure of Cognition, Psychological and Biological Model. Okay? from a group uh, and on which Jeff Hinton was already there. Jeff Hinton is one of the stars now on, on deep learning, right? So um, behind this grand title, what it did, the, the big step that it was taken is that it moved learning towards error minimization. Basically it moved artificial intelligence to optimization, okay? So suddenly we could train, we, there was a way of training these networks and minimizing an error function, okay? So suddenly, uh, uh, stack perceptrons, which is what we call multi-layer perceptrons, became uh, very highly flexible and efficient 
nonlinear regression or classification uh, machine. Okay? How do they look? The, the general organization is as follows. You get one input layer, so you get the feature vector right here, and then one or more hidden layers in between, and everything is uh, fully connected. Okay? When I saw all, all of these uh, arrows, it means that in every arrow we have a weight. Okay? So we need to calculate the, the value at this node, at this so-called neuron, then we have to sum up all the values of the previous neuron multiplied by the weights on this connection. Okay? This is fully connected and it's also a feed forward processing. So we pass from the input layer, we, we calculate all these operations and we pass them towards the, the following layer. Actually, on each neuron, they usually have a, an action to make this uh, smoother. Okay? This has to do with the way we train this. Okay? At, at the end, we have a uh, multilayer perceptron could be defined as a highly nonlinear weight dependent because it depends on all the weights that we have on these connections and transformation. And the way we, um, we learn the weights is by minimizing a uh, suitable error function. What kind of function? But the same as, as I mentioned before, if we're trying to learn um, uh, the uh, DH out of, um, of a feature vector, then we can use, for example, the minimum square error between the expected H and the predicted H. Okay? And the error is, uh, is actually used to calculate the different um, changes that we have to make in the weight by a very elegant um, algorithm called backpropagation that backpropagates the error from the output layers towards the inner layers. Okay? And with the chain rule, we can actually change the specific bit, bit, uh, error contribution. So this went on very strongly until uh, the late 90s when new relevant contributions decreased. New competitors appear, as I mentioned before, boosting, support vector machines, random forests that were actually um, maybe more interpretable and, and, and faster. And this led to what is known as the second winter of uh, neural networks. There was also a, a very big problem when in trying to go deeper in terms of number of layers. Okay? Especially uh, when we say a deep network, we mean that it has three or more hidden layers. Okay? So starting with five layers, we see it was proven that uh, the, there was uh, the problem of the vanishing gradient. So the error the gradient of the error back propagated towards the, the input suddenly became basically zero. So stacking up more layers wouldn't help at all. So we couldn't use deeper networks to solve harder problems. Okay? So things change um, in, uh, because of course, you know that we overcome these problems and to get to, to the point where we are now. About the year 2007, there was a, the first uh, breakthrough where two groups, one from uh, Hinton, I mentioned before, one from Benjo, they created ways of pre-training these networks, okay? And then they could later uh, continue the training by simply fine-tuning and using a standard backpropagation, okay? So suddenly, the floodgates open, left net with huge number of weights and new types of uh, activations, layers, regularizations, et cetera, were created. Uh, there was a completely new mood, what was impossible before, it was now much easier, and it was actually leading to major breakthroughs in, in very significant problems, especially in uh, natural language processing or in computer vision. Okay? Basically, new techniques appear. They are not so different from the previous one, but now, thanks to technology and these new strategies, uh, could be applied and we're actually working very well. Just to mention a few uh, uh, hits of, of, of some years, uh, people um, claim that the, the revolution in the deep learning really started in 2012. That was the year where um, a convolutional neural network, we will see what this means in the next slide, uh, by a group, um, by the group from Hinton, won the AlexNet, um, sorry, what the ImageNet competition, the, the network was called AlexNet. Okay? This ImageNet is this competition where there are millions of images and, and the models have to categorize to which class they belong. There are thousands of, of categories. Okay? So it was the first time that such a neural network uh, won and it did by a large margin. And after that, basically, the, the field moved towards uh, deep nets, and every year we get new models uh, beating the, the previous models on this competition. 2013, 
Google hired Jeff Hinton. Of course, these big companies have a big interest on, on this type of models. We have huge data and a lot of uh, data in, in, in the form of images. In 2014, Facebook hired Jan LeCun. That was the father of the first convolutional network. Okay? And a couple of years ago, uh, this trio, Benjo, Hinton, and LeCun, they won the equivalent to the Nobel Prize in Computer Science, which is the, the Turing Award. Okay? So two important things in order to know about uh, deep convolutional networks. Okay? There's just with these two layers, you could, you could get basically uh, most of the architectures. There's the convolutional uh, layer on which um, it is a specific uh, operation applied to images because they realize that uh, basic neural networks applied to images were not very efficient. You have a fully connected layer, then you have too many weights because you have one uh, per pixel and then multiplies uh, by the number of layers that you have. And they, they don't, it, it doesn't take into account the structure of the, uh, of the images, no? the pixels that are nearby. For example, if I have pixels uh, of a cat, basically many pixels that are nearby, they belong to the same cat. So that information is not shared. It would take fully connected uh, layers. So they replace that by uh, a filtering operation with convolutional filters. Basically, if this is the input uh, image to the network, we pass a filter of maybe three by three, which is represented here in yellow. And then we just multiply that matrix with the pixels uh, below. And then we replace the center pixel in the output image with the, the summation of, of all the values. Okay, so we, this is what we call the compose feature. Okay, basically we are learning uh, filter versions of the input image, usually to enhance some characteristics of, of the image. And then we will we would like also to learn a different scale in the image. So for that we have a subsampling operation, or what it is called a pooling uh, transformation. Okay. So basically we have an image like this and we do a pulling of two by two. Every two by two pixels, I select one, but it's the one that is gonna be in the output. If I select the maximum value of the two by two pixels, then I'm doing a max pulling operation. If I select the average, well, I'm doing average pulling, okay? Those operations are the, the important ones that I want you to keep in mind. Because most uh, deep convolutional networks are actually a combination of these two. We get the input image, and then we calculate some filter versions of the, this convolution that I mentioned in here. I'm showing an example with just four, okay? So out of the input layer, we have a convolutional layer with four filters. So it has four different uh, channels as output or what we call feature maps. And then we apply the pooling operation usually to reduce the scale, okay? So now we have uh, an image that is much smaller. Then we, we, we get, again, convolution pulling, convolution pulling, and that way we get features of different scales all combined until we get a representation that usually is very, very small. It's actually, it could be even a, a single vector, no? the same as we had before with our measuring methods. But we have calculated that ad hoc for a specific problem. Here we could use any classifier once we have this representation of the image, but an option would be to uh, use a fully connected uh, layers, a regular multilayer perceptron, so we can train the whole thing in an end-to-end -end manner. Okay, so we optimize the um, the whole process for the specific problem uh, that, that we want to solve. Okay, and this is the typical deep convolutional network, and we can have this in, uh, in, in with connections and weights in in the millions. Okay, this could be very 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 large. Okay, so. As you may think, this has plenty of applications, especially in, in my field, in computer vision. For example, if we are not uh, working with objects, but with pixels, we have semantic segmentation. So if pixel gets classified as belonging to one, one class or, or another. Now here, for example, it's grass, cat, tree, sky. Or we could do regression to calculate the bounding box of the objects in the image and then classify the image uh, inside, no? in a multitask way. So we are detecting objects by doing regression and then classifying them. Actually, the modern uh, architectures, they do everything at the same time. They, they calculate the different objects in the image by these bounding boxes. They classify them as belonging to one class or another. And also they classify each pixel to get the, the segmentation of each of them, okay? So, okay, so this is for natural images. What, what about? Ignacio. Yep. 
there's one question. There's a recurring question that our participants are asking is how first weights are initialized. For a very good question. Uh, you could do it uh, at first at random, okay? But um, when we were talking about this problem of vanishing gradient, uh, there was a lot of years of the study on how to prevent that. And then there, there are different techniques. Usually in the modern libraries, you can just choose the, the way you, um, you want to initialize the weights based on one of these techniques that is supposed to make it uh, smoother later for the training, okay? But at random, um, in, in a specific range of values between minus one and one, well, could be the first uh, way to do it. Okay, so uh, what is the current situation on deep learning by image analysis? Well, everything started a little bit late compared to the 2012 revolution, but we got there. No? So in starting in 2015, 2015, we, we started to see many applications using this type of architecture, for example, for mitosis detection, for 2D or 3D segmentation, usually the network would uh, predict the boundaries between objects, neurons, neurites, cells, etc., and then we pre-process doing something else. We have very nice networks uh, from some of uh, the, the members of uh, the PG community a couple of years ago. The CARE networks contains uh, our image restoration that allow us to increase the quality of our images, especially in the C direction. That was a, a very, very big deal. Or even we can do artificial super resolution. No? Uh, we, there's something called Deep Storm that artificially, thanks to a um, deep net, we can um, take a low resolution image and convert it to high resolution. Something similar to what we're going to do in the practice time, but with electron microscopy. So, when did it exactly start it in, in the field of biomedical analysis? I would say we look at the um, impact method. Uh, the number of publications relating microscopy and machine learning. Well, you see that uh, it doesn't uh, move much in, in about the year 2000, but there's a big peak in about 2015. This is when the first effective deep learning architecture uh, dedicated to biomedical image segmentation was created, the unit, which is almost the standard now in, in the field, with its 2D version in 2015 and the uh, 3D version in 2016. Also, uh, uh, in that year, 2015, there was the appearance of some user-friendly library, you know, some open source based on, on TensorFlow, or uh, even some commercial ones like the toolbox from, uh, from MATLAB. So that facilitates things to people that are not so hardcore um, computer scientists, but they, they want to work uh, with this type of um, models. What is the unit? The unit is very similar to what I told you before. No, uh, it has um, two paths, one we'll call the con contracting path and the expanding path. The contracting path is exactly a fully convolutional uh, network. You get convolutions, which are these uh, blue arrows, and then uh, max poolings, which are these red arrows. So we go convolving and passing to a different scale, convolving and going to a different scale until we get a very narrow representation. But they came up with the idea of then having a way of increasing again the size of the images, okay, by doing deconvolution and more convolutions. So in the end, we can, uh, we can come up with exactly uh, an inch of the same size, okay? They also have these connections in between that ensure some stability between um, the feature mass of the same size, okay? So this is uh, great because then we can, we can have uh, an, an image as an input and uh, another image as an output, so you can do uh, pixel to pixel uh, segmentation, super resolution, as we will do later, or other type of, of problems with, uh, with medical and biomedical images. So what do you need as a bioimage analyst to start uh, playing with uh, machine learning and deep learning? Well, first you need to have a, a problem to solve that is very well defined, okay? You wanna solve something like um, uh, classifying cats and dogs, well, then your images they really need to be as in cats and dogs and not something in between because otherwise your network is gonna fail uh, miserably. If uh, you're doing segmentation, you need to have annotated data that is consistent, meaning that if the same person annotates the same data twice, it should be, uh, it should coincide, it should be uh, basically the same thing or if different annotators, they shouldn't have many differences among them. And of course, you, have, you need to have high enough quality data. 
I cannot emphasize this, but deep learning uh, is not magic. You can do pretty amazing things, but if the quality of your data is not as the quality of the data, then where you train your images, then the results are not gonna be the same, okay? Don't expect miracles. In terms of infrastructure, you may need uh, to buy some hardware. Now uh, we will see that it's, uh, it's not as important as before, where we used to buy a lot of GPUs. So the, the, these networks uh, run uh, much faster on graphics uh, processing units, okay? Uh, in orders of mine to faster than a CPU. But now we can also do it uh, in even for free, as we will do today, in some uh, cloud uh, platforms such as Google Collab, Kaggle, or even uh, some paying ones like Amazon. You need data, as I said, that needs to be uh, manually annotated by experts, and they, they, they have to represent the real scenario of a problem. Okay. In general, we used to say that uh, the data has to be large enough to train the model and evaluate it. Okay? So depending on the problem, you may not need so much data. If you just have, let's say, uh, a few big images where you annotated maybe all the cells, what you could do is perform what we call data augmentation. No, maybe uh, you, you can crop the image in, into pieces and then pass to the network instead of the big image, just the small versions of it, and it learns to uh, maybe segment the, the small version. You can also artificially create new versions of your put images by doing genetic transformations, rotations, translations, adding noise, etc. Anything that makes sense depending on, on your data. Of course, if you are doing uh, segmentation and you rotate your cell to make a new version, then you also have to rotate your segmentation. So in terms of resources for data annotation, I work on, in Fiji and MJ. I would recommend you to use uh, MJ, but there are other options. I put them here. Uh, you need data to start playing with. Uh, there are repositories, especially in Kaggle. Um, you also have the cell tracking challenge that's been in running for, uh, for a few years now. Regarding deep learning software, you you want to get your hands dirty with the with the real stuff. Well, most libraries now are based on, on Python. The the most popular ones are TensorFlow, which is from Google, and PyTorch, which is from Facebook. And then, but you also have the toolbox from MATLAB or even uh, a Cafe, which is uh, um, from the Berkeley University, that that has a uh, well, uh, it's been used a lot. Now, the first unit, for example, was implemented in Cafe. And regarding, if you are in the other side, you are in the, uh, in the non-so-expert with the deep learning software side, then you may want to try user-friendly software as the one that we're gonna to introduce today. We have some options in ImageA, and today we're gonna to talk about deep ImageA. But there's some other breaches between this software and the friendly software for bioimage analysis, like uh, uh, platforms like a Cell Profiler or Elastic that have also incorporated this type of um, solution. So let's jump into our uh, plugin uh, talk for today. Okay. You want to say something? Yeah. Yes. So there's a question. How can we assess whether there is overfitting or not? That's a very good question again. Uh, so if we train, we get very good uh, performance metrics in the training, but then suddenly very uh, bad performance in test, then, um, then of course we're doing overfitting. Okay? What we usually do is uh, when we have the training set, we separate one part of the training set apart from the test that is called validation. It's gonna uh, act as, a, as an inner test for the training. So when, when we are adapting the, net, the network weight, we, we are also looking at every iteration to the results in validation. And if the, the resulting validation start to be bad, then we stop the training, okay? This is a way of preventing uh, overfitting. We'll do that uh, in a few minutes. So, regarding uh, so, friendly solution, yep. Yeah, so there's another one. Um, so, if the manual annotations, if the manual annotation of data is too complicated, uh, is it possible to train a sequential network on partial annotation and to get eventually good annotations, like to use some of the ground truth that you get from some training and then reduce it again? Or... 
Yeah, I mean, it's not the standard way of doing things, but the, there are more and more um, solutions and architectures and models proposed that use sparse annotations. And, uh, and they can improve also from non so good uh, annotations. Okay. The easiest thing you want to start with is to try to get data that can be annotated or that is annot it's been already annotated by experts. And then you can you can start from there and then adapt it to your own data. Okay. Okay. Good. Thanks. So uh, regarding DPMJ, okay, DPMJ, as I said, it's uh, it's part of this friendly uh, plugins for using deep uh, deep sol deep, uh, model, deep learning solutions and, and by image analysis. So the motivation uh, was clear. There was a, a big uh, jump no, in the number of uh, methods and applications of machine learning in, in, in the literature in terms of publications every year. There were many powerful uh, methods proposed that were uh, better than the classical approaches, but um, there was a, a problem, there was a need for high level uh, programming skills in order to implement them, okay? So and the creators that you have here as moderators so, um, the DMJ observed this lack of user friendly and general enough software in, in the field, and they came up with the with this solution. The idea is that okay, we can use uh, the open software solution to create deep learning methods such as TensorFlow, PyTorch, Cafe, and then use uh, a Java API to talk with DMJ, which is the user friendly part. Okay, and of course there was some previous work. On it, and that uh, uh, on which MVP is, is based on, and the idea is to create something that is functional, so you can integrate new models. They can process all type of new data, and it's uh, very general. So you can make it compatible with all type of different uh, network architectures. Okay, so those are the basis for the creation of uh, of this plan. So, sorry, Ignacio, to interrupt you. Uh, it seems that the noise on your uh, pullover or sweater is still is starting again. So maybe if you can just hold the microphone a bit away from it. Thanks. Yeah, I should I should not move that much. Yeah, yeah, sorry about this. <laughs> sorry, it's okay now. Okay. Yes. Thank you. Thank you for noticing. Okay. So, uh, in any case, in one single slide, this is what Deep Image uh, J does. So it connects, it bridges that hardcore training developers with, uh, with the final users, which are the via image analysts, the, the, the people who usually work with uh, Fiji or uh, MEJ, but they don't necessarily know about all the details of these hardware um, networks, okay? So from the developer side, it offers also things because uh, the developer can implement and train his or her models uh, using, for example, uh, these Python libraries, and then it creates also through the through the um, through the plugin a so-called bundle model, okay, which is basically just a folder where it's gonna have all the information of the model stored in an XML file. And this is done uh, transparently to the to the developer, as we will see, and also then you can store the weights. Uh, stored um, uh, some sample images and some pre-processing and post-processing uh, macro to uh, normalize the data as we will see next. So the only thing that the developer has to do is train the model, open it in, in DPMJ, create that uh, folder, and then upload it once it is done to the repository that is in, in the web, okay? So already in, in the web, you may find uh, solutions for problems that are similar to yours, such as uh, for noising, segmentation of different type of cells, uh, or super resolution, the, all the fair networks, uh, etc. Uh, from the user side, it's also very simple. As we will see, you just go to the repository, you select the, the network that you liked, it's a zip file, you unzip it, you put it on a folder that is um, supposed to be inside your MEJ or Fiji and application that you have to call model, okay? You put it there and then it's already uh, in readable and usable from the plugin. And then you can use 
uh, that network as a regular uh, standard plugin. Okay? You just call it from MEJ. Well, it, it needs an, an image that is open, it's output, outputting another image, and it has a preprocessing step, which is an image macro. So very, very simple. Usually in the preprocessing step, you perform normalization to make uh, your image look as close as possible to, to the images uh, on which the network was trained on. Okay? This is very, very important because the, the networks are very specific of the training data. If you don't do that, probably you, you, you won't get uh, results that are enough or close to respective results. Then you click on run, you run the, um, the network, everything is, is run uh, transparent to the user, and then you get the output. You get the prediction that is actually also post-process. You have a post-processing macro, so you, it's also provided by the developers, but you can maybe do uh, water set, you can have uh, some measurements, etc. Okay, so the idea is the proposition, as I said, is to have uh, an image that is the input, an image, and it's the output. This is the, the standard um, way of things right now, but it's to keep things uh, very simple. Okay? Everything works as an image plugin. It's recordable from macros, okay? So you can, you can also call them from macros. It's acting as a, a unified interface from TensorFlow models. Uh, so far, everything works with TensorFlow models, although there are more and more uh, different platforms that are uh, supported. Uh, it's ready out of the box. You just need to install um, the plugin. That's regular installation in, in MEJ. You put it in the plugins folder. And then once you restart MEJ, run out of the box. You don't need to have anything installed related to GPUs or Python or anything. Okay? So that's uh, uh, pros and cons. It doesn't run on GPU, so it's slower than a regular um, GPU implementation, but it runs uh, multi-threaded. So you can get also a reasonably fast uh, result. Okay, then you get the models that are uh, from the repository, and it's, it has two two sides. No, it disposes the models from the developer to the end user, and then the end user can get uh, something that is already uh, working. Fast, okay, this offers also for the, uh, the developer a, a tool to put the models in a format that the, the end user is going to use. Okay. So that's for all the theoretical part. Let's try to do some um, real action, okay? So this is uh, what I call the hands-on tutorial, where I'm gonna use Collab, which is this cloud uh, system from Google and uh, DPMEJ. Okay. So you follow the, um, you wanna really follow the tutorial, you can do it by following uh, my presentation. Uh, there's the data uh, is on this link, you have to add it to your, uh, your own drive, okay? This is important. Uh, if you, um, you un uh, download it, it's gonna take longer. You, just, you can just uh, aggregate it to your own drive and you put it on the standard um, folder, my drive, then everything is gonna work uh, out of the box, okay? And then we, we go and we click on this link from the um, presentation that is gonna open my notebook in Collab. You want to run it yourself, then you have to save a copy in your drive. Otherwise, you can only see what I do. Okay. So, yes, me... yep. just one question, which is also very recurrent. On which data can we use uh, the models of GPMJ that we have in the model folder? It has to be related to the data that on which we train the models? Or... So, you, uh, in principle, you can run it on any type of data. It has, to, it has to be the same format. Okay? If, if the network was trained on RGB images, they have to be RGB. If they, they were grayscale, they have to be grayscale. The problem is, as I said at the beginning, that these are very specific um, networks. Remember that the weights of the filters are uh, trained specifically for, uh, for the data. So it's, it's going to work better if your data looks exactly like the training data. Of course, this is always uh, the case. There are ways of normalizing, so you get um, to, for example, do histogram matching and trying to, to make them artificially as close as possible to the ones that, that you're using. But in theory, you can apply, the, apply them to any image that is open in image A, as long as the format is the same, okay? So first things first, 
uh, we can go to the um, to the notebook that I opened here. And this is a very nice environment. If you never uh, work in it, uh, it's for free, and you have a Gmail account. And then once you open it, uh, see now it's um, disconnected, but I can reconnect. It's going to work in the cloud in a system that uh, is available from Google. If there are not, um, if the demand is not too high, I will going to get a GPU. You will see. Okay, it says initializing, gets connected. And now if I go, I click on manage sessions, then I say I have a GPU. This is great because things are going to be much faster. Okay. So the main idea of this uh, notebook that I created for the last school of uh, New Vias a month ago is to use a UNET to perform super resolution. So we get a low resolution image uh, of an electron microscope image, and I'm going to convert it into a high resolution image with uh, much better uh, definition. Okay? And then at the end of the notebook, I'm going to show you how to download the train model to reuse it in deep imaging. OK, so uh, first things. Uh, first, we have to uh, install a version of TensorFlow and Keras that are compatible with, um, with deep imaging. Okay? So this uh, works right now with the version that is uh, available of deep imaging. So uh, even if by default TensorFlow has now a much higher version, then the first thing you have to do is to run this in order to, to install the, the compatible version. Okay? I'm not going to do it live because we don't have so much time and, I, and it, it, it may take some time depending on the, on the connection. Okay? So once everything is correct, even if you get some error messages, as you see here, you would say successful install Keras. Then the important thing is that um, you want to have access to your data and then you want to have it in the cloud. So for that, with these two lines, we can mount our own drive um, directories into uh, Google Colab. Of course, this is a little bit dangerous, so it, it asks you to have some permissions. So if you go to this uh, URL, then it asks you to, to validate that you are who you are, and then it gives you a code that you can just copy paste it here, and then it would say mount it and uh, slash content slash drive. When this happens, then you should have here your drive um, folder as well. So if everything went fine, then you should have uh, access directly to the directory that I just passed you with the data. Okay, so it's, it's called Nevias TS15 because it's from TS15 uh, school images, and you have two folders, train and test. Okay, so in, on every uh, so-called cell of code, you can run it by clicking here, and then you will see usually uh, an output. Here, for example, I read the list of images. I know that I have 100 images for training. Okay. Loading them into memory is what takes more time in the whole process, apart from training the network. Uh, but it usually takes about one, two minutes maximum. I open one of those images here, so you can see them. It's 1024 by 1024 8-bit pixel image with some mm, mouse cortex uh, and neurons of uh, high resolution. So since I only have 100 images, and they may not be too much, and also they are very big uh, for the, the standard networks, usually the input to the networks are 256, 256, 512, 512, then what I can do is what I mentioned before, I can create artificial versions of it. I just crop the image into pieces. So I'm going to create out of each of the image a 4x4 four four, um, uh, crops of 256 by 256. Here you have the code. You run it, then you get uh, images that look like this. Okay, this is the first patch that I created. So out of each of the hundred images, now I have sixteen times hundred. Well, I have sixteen hundred images uh, to train. So much better. Then, based on this uh, paper that uh, came out um, a few months ago, we can simulate the low-resolution images basically by down sampling and um, applying some Gaussian blurring. So to, in order to train on low resolution images, if I don't have them, I can create them like this. Now, in this case, the input image is again of the same size, 256 by 256, but as you see, it's much worse uh, than the, the resolution of the, 
uh, of, the, of the real image. Okay, so I'm going to train uh, inputting this type of images and considering this my expected uh, or my desired output. Okay, then I'm going to define a network that is again based on the on the unit with some differences that I experimentally I found uh, useful for this uh, notebook because uh, it works uh, well and it is uh, faster. So I used again three steps, okay, or three levels. Okay, when I the input is 256 by 256, have some convolutions and and instead of max pools, I do average pools, which are these red arrows. Okay, these yellow arrows are convolutions uh, with dropout. It's a way of doing uh, regularization that also helps. Okay, and then uh, we go up again here by doing uh, up convolutions. Um, called deconvolutions to go up and recover the original site. Okay. I use Keras. Uh, if you are familiar with Python, you'll see that it's, it's a very simple high level uh, code because you just say, okay, the input is defined with a specific uh, size. Then for each layer, you just put one line and you say, okay, my first convolution is 16 filters of size three by three specific activation. Here is the initialization of the weights. This is the technique applied to initialize the weights. Okay. And then I want the, the output of the of the input image to be of the same size. Okay. So I put by the same. And then I just flag the previous layer. So by doing this, I hope it's readable enough. You just go creating all those parts on the on the graph that I represented here. Okay. So these four lines of code are equivalent to these uh, arrows and, and this first two arrows and first two, two lines, okay? Once we have that, in, in Keras, we have to compile the model, okay? And then we have to tell them, uh, to tell the library which is the optimizer that we're gonna use to find the best weights, and also which is the loss function. This is the error function that we were mentioning before, which is the error that we want to minimize. Since I'm doing pixel to pixel uh, super resolution, then I'm gonna use min, minimum square error, which is very typical for that. And I can also add a secondary metric that is not used for the, um, uh, for the training, but also for um, showing how well it is doing in terms of another uh, metric, okay? So once I run this, I get a few texts telling me all the details of the, of the sizes of the, of the layers. And then as you see in the last layer, then I get an output that is 256 by 256 by one, which is just one single channel, okay? And I have the total number of parameters. As you say, here's uh, almost half a million parameters, and I did a uh, reasonably small network. Then for the training, we get uh, a few important parameters to set, okay? As I said, we have the validation split, okay? This is what we mentioned before. So the validation set, uh, how big it's gonna be. I created with a 10% of the training uh, samples. So I, I decide when to stop based on the, the loss, the error committed in validation, okay? When it starts to go up, I stop. And that is defined with something called pacing, okay? How many uh, iterations or here are called epochs. How many epochs I'm gonna uh, wait until the error in validation is, uh, it, it, changes up. Epoch is a very um, typical definition from, from uh, artificial neural networks and it's nothing but just uh, the number of times that the train set is seen by the network, okay? So when we are training, so basically uh, we could say iteration, but iteration is used for something else. So uh, the epoch is how many times uh, the, the whole data set is seen, okay? If we train for 10 epochs, then the the 1,600 images are passed uh, 10 times through the network, okay? And then we have something called batch size, which is related to both how we train and the GPU, because it's the, these are the number of images that is gonna be trained at the same time in the GPU, but also how many images uh, are we gonna wait until we update the weight, okay? So the, the larger it is, the faster is usually the training, but it, we have to play with, with that value. In general, the important uh, value for, um, for training is the number of epochs and uh, the batch size, okay? So if I normalize the data in order uh, to have it uh, ready for the training, I could just click here, model.fit. I 
introduce my my training set and my validation split is just a parameter okay and the bat size as well okay then again i'm not doing it interactively because we're running out of time but uh, you will see if you run it at home it goes epoch by epoch and the, uh, plotting loss this is the training loss and the the metric that we selected no? and for the training set and also for the validation set in this case it's called val loss or uh, in this case val metric or val mean absolute value and then you see how epoch by epoch the loss goes um, getting a, a smaller and in principle the validation could could also fluctuate because those are images that are not used for training once we train we can plot it and see what, how it looks then the blue line is the training law you know that always goes down okay and then the validation it actually fluctuates but it, it wasn't that bad actually the validation is even better than the than the training uh, result this is for the loss and this is for the metric that i that i chose okay, okay so once we have the model trained in in the training set then we can apply it to our test images and see how they look. No? So here I put you 10, you, uh, you apply it to this other, um, as you run this cell, you would load uh, 10 images. You see that they look pretty similar as uh, the ones that we have. We have to, again, pre-process them the same way, calculate the same uh, low resolution images exactly the same way we did before. If we convert them to images between zero and one, we have to do the same thing. And then we can apply them the whole network. We can evaluate them by uh, calling this method called evaluate that gives us the loss and, and the metric in, in test, or we can actually plot them, which is more, uh, more interesting now, and show some of those images and see how well they do. You see how these are the input image to the network. Again, this is test, so the network has never seen this image before. This is the ground truth, and this is the output, okay? So I would say for the little training that we had and the small network, it actually did quite, uh, quite a good job. Now we have uh, recovered some of the double membranes, and we start to see organelles in a more decent way. The jump from here to here is actually quite impressive. Okay. So... Ignacio? Yep. Yeah, there are some questions related to the activation of the convolutional layer. So why do you choose uh, exponential linear units in, in, in the convolutions in general? And then for the last one, why did you choose sigmoid? Yeah, so those are um, typical choices that we have to do. Well, uh, for the, um, the final uh, sigmoid, well, this is very classic, but for uh, ELU or uh, other kind of activations, this is all trial and error, okay? For me, most of the decisions that I, I took to create this network uh, were based on trying to make it smaller so I could run it fast. Although uh, you can see that depending on the GPU that we are assigned when we are training, uh, we may have each epoch of, well, in this case, it's 21 seconds. Sometimes I connect it to, to Google Colab and it runs in 10 seconds. Sometimes it is uh, one minute. So it really depends. Um, but my idea was to, to show you something fast that had a reasonable result. So ELU worked better for me than ELU. Uh, average pooling worked better than max pooling. So these kind of decisions, I took them by trial and error. So this is a very experimental uh, part of, of the network. Usually the idea is that you want to start playing with something like this. Then I would recommend you to start with my configuration because you know that is something that works at least this well. So you should replicate it. And then you start playing with your data to see if you can find something better. Okay. So once we have uh, the model uh, trained, if we are a, a developer and we want to pass this to our uh, collaborators, how do I import it into DPMJ? Okay. This is very important. I can just. Uh, run these pieces of code where I save the model into a folder, okay? It would get saved directly into the root folder of Collab, okay? As it is, but it's not a, it's not a big deal. Uh, you can uh, 
look for it later and make sure that it is there. You see, for example, I here I I here you see that when I did ls, it appeared here as a folder called save underscore model, and then I zip it and download it. Okay, so this is basically saving the model the way TensorFlow uh, knows, creating a zip file, and then it get it would get downloaded through the browser. Okay, once I have this. I'm going to follow the, the presentation again, so I don't, I don't do anything wrong, hopefully. Okay. So we are already here. You follow it all the, all the steps. Then, uh, steps over. Ignacio? Yep. Uh, when do you stop the training? When is it acceptable when comparing ground truth or is it because you used a specific callback or how did you stop the training? Yeah, I use this callback that I, I show you. It's called early stop. This, this is the, the importance of the patient, okay? So when I was using patients, I, I said, okay, I set the patient to five, I think, okay? So basically, it means this is better seen in the graph. Okay. If the validation fluctuates up more than the patient times, then it stops. So usual values for patients are five or 10, 20, depending on, on your data. Again, uh, this is something that you have, to, you have to fix. But what I usually do is I, I leave it uh, running for, uh, a specific number of epochs until it reaches a plateau, okay? And then and in, the, in that plateau, you, if you don't see much improvement, then you can say, okay, maybe I have to use an, an, a patient in order to stop it before because it's a waste of time, right? Or sometimes the, the validation starts to go up, 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 because if your images in validation are not that similar to the, to the training set, then it is really a, a matter of stopping before, okay? In this case, they go down nicely at the same time. So it's, it's not a big deal. You could also run it for 20, 30 epochs and the results would be very different. So we have already downloaded our uh, folder, okay? It's called safe model. It, was, it, 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 it is a zip file, okay? When I downloaded it, it is um, basically and it has the same uh, name .pv, and it has a set of variables here that is actually, this is the, the weight of the, um, the network, okay? This is what, what, what I need if I'm a developer in order to create the bundle model for um, deep imaging, okay? So I'm gonna follow the steps, so I don't do anything wrong. I said, okay, I unzip the folder, and whenever I want, I open Fiji, and then I call deep imaging. So if I install it correctly, dpmj should be under plugins, and then dpmj. If I call dpmj, plugins, dpmj, um, build bundle model, okay? This is where we're gonna import the model that we train in Google Collab, okay? So I call it, so it gets open, okay? And now you have a bunch of descriptions here. You have to browse and select the folder where you get your um, your model, okay? In that case, I think I put it in documents, presentations, okay. That's gonna be interesting. I think I can put it directly from here. Okay. There you are, okay. I choose it, I have to choose the folder, okay? Even though here it says drop TensorFlow model protobuf, you have to select here, when you click on browse, you have to select the folder, okay? Then we click on next, you see that the path appears here. We click on next, and then it loads the information here. It says it's a TensorFlow model with uh, some specific uh, characteristics. You can actually visualize it if you want. As the, the graph size, uh, etc. Well, 
we are not interested on that we can keep uh, going on okay so we go next here we see that it read the the images uh, size okay 256 by 256 256 by 256 so everything goes uh, correctly i click on next and now i'm gonna keep looking at the at the at the presentation so i don't skip anything okay everything is correct now um, we have to select which is the padding size okay this is important because now uh, we're allowed to use images that are larger than the input image of the network and we're going to use a patch strategy okay so when there are um, patches that are in the borders we need to figure out what to do with the pixels uh, for the, the filters that are in, in in the borders so we have to in, include some padding in uh, here usually and uh, the path size is 256 but i'm going to add pad uh, 64 for example okay this works well then i click on next then i have to fill the information about my uh, develop plug now so i can say okay this is my unit for super resolution i, I just put the, the information i want here said so author it's me I can put a URL. If I have a publication, I can put it there. I can put the version, the date, the reference, etc. But with a, a full name and the author should be fine. Okay. Now we jump into the pre-processing macro that I told you before. Okay. So if you remember the, the images in order to be um, a process, they have to be um, converted to zero one uh, values so float and then if my images are um, a bit they will be between zero and 255 so i have to do two things the you know not to forget i put them here okay so i have to convert them to 32 bit that so you, you can type it or you can actually select it here that's very nice so i can i click on convert to 32 bit and already Add the macro comment that does that. And then I need to divide the image by 255 to have the values between 0 and 1. Okay? So that I maybe I can simply copy from the presentation, or I can go here, say run. I don't know, you see it well. Quote, divide, dot, 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 double quotes. Again, comma, double quotes, value equal to 55. If you ever played with uh, image macros, you know that what we're doing here is just uh, converting the input image to 32 bit and then dividing it to 255. Okay, so all the values will, will, will be between 0 and 255. Okay, I click on next. And then I have a post processing uh, macro option. I actually do not need to, to do any post-processing because the output is supposed to be already my super resolution image, okay? We don't need any uh, post-processing, but before going to next, I'm gonna create, because I know if I go to next, it's gonna ask me for a test image and I don't have one. So I go back and then I'm gonna create one, okay? So I downloaded the test images here so I can open one of them. It's open on my other screen, but you have it here. Okay, so you see this is uh, uh, the image at high resolution. To simulate the low resolution version of it, then I need to blur it. Okay, so for that, I can uh, reproduce what I did on on Python, basically with the Gaussian blur filter of radius three. Okay. Okay, so now I get a much blurry image if I zoom in. You see how it looks like low resolution image. Okay, so I think I have everything I want. Now I can click on next. Okay, and now it says run a test on an image. Here, you would get all the images that are open at, in image J or PG at that moment. Okay, I can run the test and see what happens. Then you get a window with information about the 
the processing and also you see in a separate window how the different patches are going being uh, processed. Okay? You see the running time, the loading the CPU, the number of patches, you created 64 patches, and then the memory that is being used. So it's not up, uh, applied in, in GPU, but for an inference time, it's very reasonable. So you can work with this. Okay, when it is done, you get the result. You see the result is 32 bit. If we go through the through the pixel, you see there are between zero and one. Okay, or if I if I plot the histogram, you see minimum is zero, maximum zero point ninety three. Okay. And if you zoom in, you see how the result actually looks like the one that we have in in Collab, no? Nice high resolution, a cheap version of it. So now I can just click on next. Now I have to save uh, the random model in my uh, folder. If I'm not wrong, I have to go and save it. Okay. I run the test. I just want to make sure I did everything correct. Okay. So if the model folder doesn't exist, okay, I have to create it. So if I go here, again, I have to go to uh, applications. It doesn't, it doesn't show up here, so I cannot create it directly. I can go to the to Fiji. Here in, in a Mac, it's a little bit complicated because you have to go to applications and open the contents. But see, I don't have a model folder, so I have to create it with the, the name models, okay? That's it, okay? And then I just click, go back to J and click on save bundle model. If everything uh, was correct, you would see how you have all the, the parts correctly saved. Even the, the test image would be safe as a sample image for everybody who wants to use this model. Hey, Matthew, it is already seven past five. Just for you to know, okay? Okay. Just, and we just, okay. just finishing. Okay. okay. <laughs> also, I didn't start late. <laughs> okay. So we, we click on finish. We are done. And now we go. Let's say, okay, I'm gonna close this image. My test input image now doesn't work. So I'm now gonna save it. I'm gonna create another test image. Let's say I'm gonna take a number five, okay? Again, I have to create it again. So I go and process it with a Gaussian blur, okay? So now this is my low resolution image. And now if I go to deep image, DPMJ, DPMJ ran, then, oops, this, I don't have them there. Oh, okay, I know what I did wrong. I think it gets saved inside the model folder. I have to create my own folder, right? Okay. So inside, I have to create it with a specific name. I, I'm gonna call it SR unit, okay? And then I'm gonna put all the, the save information that I have there here. Sorry about that. Okay, so inside models, I have to give it a name. Okay, that's that's the only part that I that I forgot. So if I go now to plugins dpmj, dpmj run, then it, it does run and it recognizes the model with the name that I that I set it in the configuration. Okay. So you see here, as soon as I selected it, gives me the information that I wrote. Also the overlap size, the everything, but the pre-processing I have to select it manually. I have to go and say, okay, use the pre-processing macro that, that I set there and for post-processing, I don't do anything. So if I click in okay, it's gonna be applied to the input image. Okay, the same way as before, we get this window telling us about the information on, on the computation, and then the output image gets constructed on the fly. Okay. If I zoom in, 
you will see how the result is actually the pseudo super resolution is. Okay, so I'm gonna leave it here then. You have questions, otherwise I really thank you for uh, being here. There are some, I think, interesting questions uh, regarding the reuse of models. So, so when you want to reuse a model, how do you know that you can use it with your data or how can you quantify that is doing properly the processing? Or, no. you know, all this matter about reusing trainnet models? Yeah, so this is a very important question because uh, most of the models, okay, we get very excited about them and we want to reuse them, but then you have to take into account that the, the input data needs to be very similar to the, to the data that was used to train the model. So either you have access to something like I just did, the collab notebook, and then you will train it on your own data. Or if your data looks similar, then you can try to uh, open the model uh, folder, uh, open the test image, and see how it looks. For example, uh, in my case, I created this one. I know that the, if I have this example image, right? This is my example image, it's 8-bit and it has this uh, uh, aspect. If I, if I go and look at, for example, the histogram, I can try to have images with the same type of content and same, same type of histogram in 8-bit. And I would expect the network to perform more or less similar. Okay, so there are ways of normalizing your data so it looks like this histogram or otherwise. The best approach always would be to, uh, to have access to the way the, the model was trained. You can contact the authors. Of course, uh, this collab notebook is all up for you guys. You can play with it as much as you want and, and reuse it and spread the word. Okay, and um, there was another one. So uh, in your example, what you did was to blur the original image with the Gaussian blurring and then you train it in network to, to provide you the high resolution or super resolution image. So how do you make sure that the network didn't just learn how to do the inverse of the Gaussian library? I, actually, it is what it's doing, <laughs> um, which is not that easy. Uh, but uh, in this case, uh, I have to say that I, I, I planned first another uh, approach where I actually downsampled the images as well. But uh, for the version of DPMEJ, that wasn't allowed to have an input that is uh, smaller than the output. So I had to redo it and, and play it this way, okay? Uh, in separate resolution, I actually what uh, the networks are doing is learning how to do upsampling and uh, undoing this kind of uh, blurring that is uh, inherent to the resolution, the low resolution level. So yeah, this is actually what it should learn. I think that's all I can say. Um, ah, Ignacio, are you available for personal consulting? <laughs> Scientific reasons, always. <laughs> you can contact me. I'm always happy to collaborate. And, and yeah, and I guess the same uh, is for all these moderators that we have here. Okay. Okay. Uh, yeah, I think it, that, that's all. Yeah. Okay. Thank you so much. I'm sorry about the noisy microphone. I hope you enjoy the talk as much as I did. Thank you, Ignatius.